Hello, live, hoping this microphone's working. I'm at, on my big screen, but I guess the screen's the same size for you. Hoping audio's okay. I think I've used this before and the audio's okay. Um, so we've got a couple of questions here. Oh, got it all right. A couple of questions here to talk about on tonight's Facebook um, live Q and A. Uh, we've got some questions, which are a uh, few big ones, a few big questions. What's the cover for a vision after surgery? Yeah, I know what this is about because I had, a, well, I think we've had a couple of these, but I had a big one in the clinic. I had a big conversation with someone about this in the clinic. Um, and it's a good question. Um, the cover for revisions after surgery, because sometimes what you'll find is that people will say um, you're covered for one year, two years, 10 years, whatever, a lifetime cover, but they cover different things. So you've got to find exactly what is covered when people talk about um, having a cover or a guarantee. So basically, pretty much any hospital that we're having procedure will cover you for 30 days for complications. That's a given. So if you have a hematoma, blood collecting inside, or an infection, or a problem like that, you'll be covered. You won't have to pay again if you have to go back to theatre, or if you have to put a prolonged stay in the hospital. Um, this is for cosmetic surgery, I should say, because most cosmetic surgery is done as what's called a fixed price package at the private hospitals. So I guess that's the first thing to check, that you are your surgery is covered under what's called a fixed price package. Uh, and certainly all the cosmetic surgery that we do here, um, is under fixed price packages um, and the price is set which covers the things I'm about to say. Um, if it's not a fixed price package uh, and that's for things that are more likely to be insured like hernia repairs and things like that. So if you're not insured then they might say oh we'll do it for you and we'll charge this amount which will proportionally be probably less than what the cosmetic operations are because then you're just paying to have that hernia repair if you have to stay in hospital longer, or if you have to go back to theater, or if, you have, if you're not happy with the result, you have to pay again. So that's different. So cosmetic surgery is a fixed price package, and the, the package includes 30 days for revision surgery, and then um, there is a period after that where you have um, a cover uh, sorry, 30 days for, for complications, and then you have the period after that where you have cover for revisions. Revisions being things not looking quite right, not looking as how we expected them to look. Um, it is a little, I've had someone, <laughs> a couple of these, I had someone in the clinic the other day saying, you know, what, what is the tolerance? So if the cleavage is this wide, will you do a revision? You know, where the, if it's, you know, different dimensions there's no numbers on it because the thing about medicine and certainly in cosmetic surgery is not like there's no st statistics that can say if one breast is two millimeters higher than the other then we'll do a revision but if it's you know one millimeter higher we won't do a revision we don't have set numbers on it unfortunately it is up to um us to say whether we are it is the result we expected the most important thing is that if it is just, for instance, the big one is implants. If your implants are too big or too small, that is not covered. So if the cosmetic effect, the cosmetic result is what we expected it to be, but you feel they're too big or too small, then that, or you just don't like them, then that is not covered. So that's quite important to stress, which is why I always say to people, come back to clinic as often as you want. We'll do the sizes again. We'll look at photos because you've got to be absolutely sure with your implant choice before having implants because um, that is not covered. However, if the implants aren't sitting right, if they're too high, too low, too wide, uh, one's higher than the other or whatever, those things are covered for a, a set period of time. And this is what you'd have to talk about the hospitals where I work, the BMI hospital, which is a priory, you cover you for six months. The Spire covers you for 12 months. Um, polyurethane implants are made by uh, Polytech and they are distributed by a company called Q Medical. And Q Medical offer a two year warranty on the implants. So if you have um, Polytech implants, then there is a two year cover for revision surgery. Um, 
And so that covers most revisions. So if the implants aren't sitting right, doesn't look quite right, that covers um, the, the most of the problems between six months to two years, depending on where you have it done. Following that, then you've got to look at the uh, follow-up appointments. Uh, we don't charge for follow-up appointments here, so you can come back at any time with any problem um, to see me if you've got a problem and you're not happy about things or if you're just worried about things, you can come back five years, 10 years down the line. But if it's after that six month stroke, two year period and you need more surgery, you will have to pay for the surgery. Um, now the implants themselves have a warranty, but the important thing to be uh, realized about that is that's just the implants that's got the warranty. So the implants, in fact, all the implants we use here have got a lifetime warranty. So you could say on the head, the headline could be, come and have surgery here. We give you a lifetime warranty, but you've got to be careful because we don't say that because that's just, well, because that's just the implants and that people might think, oh, I've got a lifetime warranty. If I'm not happy in five years, I can have surgery again. Now you can have surgery again. They'll give you a new implant, but it's just the implant they'll give you. So you have to pay the hospital costs. And the other thing is to say is the, the implants, well, this could be the whole thing. I've got some other questions. Right? The implants have different warranties and if the, the thing to do is uh, you know we'll give you details about that so the difference in the warranties of the implants are what the warranty covers so they pretty much all cover um they all pretty much all cover um can i do this while i'm doing it because i'm on the they pretty much all cover rupture so all implants um cover rupture so if, if the implant ruptures then you'll get a new implant now they do ask you to send it back back to the um to the um to the company um to check that it was damaged it wasn't damaged by the surgeon uh, but they all they, they cover rupture uh, they don't all cover capsular contracture for instance Nagor do cover capsular contracture Allagan don't but Nagor um, cap uh, but Nagor uh, Amy I will answer your question in a minute um, Nagor uh, cover capsular contracture but Allagan don't but Allagan give you money if you uh, have a rupture, they give you money as well as giving you a new implants. If the rupture happens within 10 years. So there are different nuances between the different, um, the different um, uh, um, warranties between the implants. Uh, and so something that, that's something you might want to look at if you're interested in. Um, you can get into these things quite deeply, but the important thing is to say that if someone says they've got a 10 year warranty, you've got to be careful. That's not just the implant they're talking about when they're talking about the hostel costs as well. Um, uh, we've got some other questions here, but I'm going to do a one just in case it rolls off. Uh, I'm due to see you for my six week check soon. My implants are sitting far apart with quite a big gap. Do you think this will get better as they soften? Is this something you think would require revision? If they stay like that, thanks, Jonathan. Amy, I think um, your implants are on top of the muscle, are they, or underneath the muscle? The only time um, I've ever seen a problem with the gap being too wide is when they're on top of the muscle, because that can be a problem if the gap's too wide. Now, first of all, six-week check, totally wouldn't worry about it at this stage, uh, is, the, is the underlying thing I would say. At six weeks, don't worry about these sorts of things. On top of the muscle, okay. So this is very rarely a problem on top of the muscle. Um, never, I think I can safely say I've never had a problem with it on top of the muscle. Um, the important thing to realize when you're looking at cleavages, and this is something that I, people are very worried about. People are often worried about cleavage being too wide. And something I stress to point out pre-op is that what you're trying to do is enhance the cleavage that you've already got. So sometimes people want their cleavage to be closer together. They want their breasts to be closer together. You can't really make the breast be closer together because you've got to have the implant covered with um, breast tissue. So if you try and put the implant where there's no breast, then that will you'll be able to see the edges. You'll be able to feel, feel the implant. That won't be right. So you try and look at these... Um, you know, cleavage that you got before and then that cleavage is enhanced now you can push them together and what have you um with bras and things like that but at the actual surgery is enhancing the cleavage that you've got already so that's something to look at but at six weeks i wouldn't worry about it and i certainly wouldn't worry about uh, talking about revisions and what have you at six weeks normally the total minimum is about three months so we start looking at that sort of thing and the longer you leave it the better to be honest um, but uh, i wouldn't worry too much about it at this stage um, 
the other thing that's provision when's it okay to play sports such as football and rugby feel free to come back on me on that amy if you want to um ask anything um but in the meantime i'll go to the gynecomastia one uh gynecomastia uh of sports such as football and rugby after gynecomastia um uh well i would say Football and rugby are different. I get well, they're both pretty. I mean, rugby. Oh dear, rugby. I'd say a couple of months for rugby. Football. I don't know. Is football pretty physical? I guess it is. Um, I mean, I'm aware of the game of football. And what is involved in it? Um, uh, oh, tie doesn't look straight. Um, yeah, probably probably six to eight weeks for for sort of contact sports when you're going to get knocked about. Uh, Non-contact sports, and the ideal one is something like cycling, two weeks. But um, the thing about gynecomastia correction, it is quite traumatic, although the scars are pretty small and you can hardly see them. It is quite traumatic. You do get quite a lot of bruising and swelling. Uh, bruising, not so much also in the first week or two, but swelling certainly in the first couple of months. So I would leave it a couple of months before getting into that sort of stuff. And then I would do it gently to start with, if that's possible, and see how you go, because it might swell. That's all you're going to do. You're going to make it swell. You're not going to do anything desperately harmful but it's just going to make it swell and it's going to be uncomfortable and to be honest with you you're probably not going to want to do it too much before then certainly anything really physically active um so i would leave it a couple of months for that uh different teams different times as doctors this is something that came up um on my never accept a lift from strangers page my facebook page of, never, of my book um uh um about a person who had lip fillers and the fillers were all lumpy and um, she had them fixed. And the, the, I guess the point that the, there was, to be honest, there's two points that came out of the story. One point was that uh, be careful who does your lip fillers because uh, um, I think it was someone who was just basically, uh, I don't know, a hairdresser or, or someone in the, in the hairdressers who did the lip fillers. And this is a massive problem we've got particularly with fillers there's absolutely no law about anyone buying fillers at least botox is a is a uh, is a is a <laughs> is a drug um so botox has to be prescribed but then there's no law about who injects it but anyway at least it has to be prescribed so they have to get their hands on it fillers doesn't have to be prescribed fillers prescribed is a device uh, so fillers can be bought by anybody you can buy them you, you whoever you are can buy them um, any member of the public can buy fillers and inject fillers. Um, as long as you're not saying to the person you're injecting the fillers, as long as you're not telling them you're a doctor, you know, or, or trained, as long as you, you know, the person knows you're not trained, or that you might be saying nothing, they might assume you're trained, but you don't have to have any training to do it. So this is one of the problems and why at the moment we're having to tell people to empower the public to say to people, are you trained? Have you got any qualifications? Have you got any, um, indemnity uh, and what have you behind you um because anyone do it and i think this is a problem this person had had fillers <coughs> excuse me and um and come to harm but then she'd gone to a cosmetic clinic or an aesthetics clinic to have them fixed by this chap who's an a and e doctor um and they were saying oh this chap was great to fix it and he, and he was great to fix it and good on him but that's the other thing is you know the cosmetic clinic were had an, a man in there who was an a and e doctor and the thing I always say, and the point I've written, and the reason I've written a book to say about how to look for training in your doctor is to look, to just be aware of what training your doctor's got. There's nothing wrong with A&E doctors doing cosmetic clinics. I mean, lots of, to be honest with you, there's not many plastic surgeons in these cosmetic clinics. It's usually A&E doctors or GPs or all sorts of different sorts of trained doctors, which is fine. Um, but it is just being aware what the training is because i think a lot of people assume they're plastic surgeons because they're in an aesthetics clinic or i think this guy owned the clinic owned the aesthetics clinic so if you own an aesthetic cosmetic clinic you might think that they're a cosmetic surgeon or um, that's another thing cosmetic surgery is not really a specialty but um this uh chap wasn't really a surgeon at all there's no surgical training in any &E. it's a um it's it's not got any formal surgical training he might have done some training but in surgery but it's not really a surgical specialty, but if you're doing fillers and Botox, um, I think it's perfectly reasonable to be not uh, a, a surgeon to be doing these things. But the main thing is I think people need to know what, who you are and what sort of training you've got, and that's really up to them to ask it. I mean, one of the things I've been doing just now 
is uh, I've been working on my appraisal as a doctor. All doctors have to do an appraisal every year. I have to put together what I've done over the year to show we have to all show that we are trained to a certain level and that we are not that we're trained to a certain level, but that we've done um, things throughout the year to improve our practices and to show that we are looking auditing our results to show that we are looking after patients basically and we're looking after ourselves and that we are um, producing good uh, good results and getting good feedback from patients and uh, we have to be shown to be doing this every year and that is something any doctor on the GMC register has to do so th that's the issue you see if you're a hairdresser or if you're not got any medical training you're not beholden to these appraisal systems to these um, checks. Similarly, you don't have to have the insurance that we have to have uh, as doctors. So I think there's a lot to be said for looking at the training of the person who is doing the thing. And the th they sh it should be um, comparable to the thing that is being done. So maybe if you're having cosmetic breast surgery, it's not unreasonable that that surgeon should have some training uh, in surgery, preferably plastic surgery, preferably breast plastic surgery. Um, but if you're having Botox and fillers, then maybe just a, a qualified doctor would be fine as long as they've got experience in um, they've got experience in um, in the procedure. Look at this, Joanne. Where are you? Be what a consultation with you. Come on in, Joanne. Um, I am. Shall I? I don't know, shall I say it or shall I write it? I'm going to do both. I am based in Edge Baston in Birmingham. So that's where I am, Joanne. I am in Birmingham. And if you're in the West Midlands area, please, by all means, come and give us a ring or drop us a Facebook message or whatever. And we can, uh, I'll be very happy to see you. But uh, if you're, where, where are you, Joanne? Are you, um, are you Midlands or are you elsewhere? Um, because if not, there's a lot of very good plastic surgeons throughout the country, um, which is what my book's all about. Never accept a lift from strangers. How to find um, the best cosmetic surgeon for your cosmetic breast surgery. Is that what it is? How to choose. Yep. That's my book. Uh, I've got one there. Um, so... Oh, you're in Birmingham. There you go. So, yeah, you can come here. But I was saying there's lots of good plastic surgeons about. Um, and so, yeah, so I think that's uh, quite comprehensively answered that. Um, so there you go. So, Joanne, uh, nice to see you here. I do this every night, 7 o'clock, not every night, every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. So um, I'll be here again next Tuesday. If you've got any questions, I need, I need the lot. You need the lot. I've got a special offer on the lot. Full, we should, <laughs> no, um, I don't know what the lot means, but um, be very happy to help to do the lot, Joanne, um, and we don't have any special offers, but yes. Um, if you want information on anything, Joanne, get, let us know, uh, give us an e uh, drop us an email or, or get, us on, get on Facebook and we can send you some details about, yeah, about that, that's, a, that's yeah, definitely send you some information. We've got guides about um, breast, tummy, um, there's quite a bit on my website. I think I've done a blog post not that long ago about mummy makeover, so, um, it's a it's a big deal, mummy makeover, um, but it's quite a popular thing because you get everything done in one go. So um, we can you give us a call tomorrow. Oh one two one four five four three six eight zero, and um, speak to Laura. And yeah, we'd be very happy to help you. And it's lovely to see you here tonight. And um, Dawn Barkley's just joined, um, but I'm gonna hi Dawn. Um, hope you're okay. Um, I was gonna. I was going to go actually, um, if that's okay. Um, but this has been good. I've had lots of comments here tonight, so thank you for that. And Amy, always lovely to see you here. Please don't worry, everything's going to be absolutely fine. I know it is, but you are a bit of a worrier, Amy, but I think we're going to be fine. Um, so um, I am, I'm getting lots of thumbs up. That's good, isn't it? Oh, let's stay on. No, I'm not. Um, I'm going to go because um, it's getting on. And so thanks for coming, everybody. And I will see you. See you next week, 7 o'clock here. In, well, maybe not here. I don't know where I'll be out and about, maybe. And um, it's been lovely. I don't normally see all these things. I normally do it on my phone. Um, okay. Bye.